The inspection on this wag on the wall clock was done on a previous video. I'll be dismantling the movement and doing what is needed to get this working. As I mentioned earlier, this clock was produced sometime in the mid to late 1800s. An excellent example of a transition clock from wood to metal of that time period. One quick look at it before it gets pulled apart for repair. Interesting feature is this fastener for the bells. Color of it looks bronze, but it's actually hand carved out of some type of wood. Here you can see where someone has attempted to use a rotary grinder to remove rust. And this spacer is made from wood as well. These are the pins locking the back plates in place. Time side back plate. Verge, second wheel, escape wheel, main wheel, locking pin, strike side back plate, governor fan, third wheel, second wheel count wheel, main wheel. These rivets are loose. They'll need to be tightened. Lots of green corrosion around the brass bushings. Cock for the verge. It's made from cast brass, a nice square nail. All the brass pieces on this movement are made from cast brass. This needs to be tightened up. It's causing the click to have uneven nesting to the ratchet teeth. Look closely and you'll see the poor fit up of the click to the ratchet teeth. These rivets are allowing the ratchet wheel assembly to split apart. Not good. Lots of rust. This keeper is made from soft steel wire. Fits into a milled slot in the arbor. I'll need to separate it and pull it off. The click has some wear on it. This small unworn section is a non-working surface of the click. This bearing surface will need to be polished. Severely worn here. There's holes inside the bore. One of the worst I've seen. Just look at those holes. The ratchet is loose from the main wheel. Check the amount of wear. Remove these rivet pins. The rivets are all bent. This condition had to have happened when they were installed. Guess they wanted to make sure they were long enough. Separated for the first time in about 160 years. And again, all these are cast brass parts. This rough surface is the unmachined cast brass. This smooth surface is where the casting was machined on a lathe. And on this side, more lathe machining of the cast brass. Mounted in the six jaw adjustable chuck, the original rough casting OD of the center hub is off center. This means the chain sprocket has been running off center since it was new. There's no sidewall left. There's not enough material left to install a bushing. There's no parts available in the parts houses for these. I have a fix in mind. First, a sharp hole punch, slightly larger than the hub. Now a piece of 360 brass rod to fit in the enlarged hole. More tape to protect the brass rod. A temporary sandblasting processing holder. I'll put a couple relief cuts in it right about here. Rough saw the abraded brass rod to length. True up both ends of the brass rod. Remove the sandblasting processing holder. Both surfaces have been abraded, along with the inside. The fit is snug, but fairly loose in areas, but nicely for the next step. I'll be using this small oxyacetylene torch. I'm using a 45% silver rod. It has a higher tensile strength than the brass. It flows in real nice.
A wood chuck is one of the most accurate ways to turn a part. Now to secure the part, it's ready to machine a new center. Looking great so far. I'll need to cut some steel pins for the rivets. They nest together nicely. Nice snug fit. Now to fit it into the retainer wire groove. Need to remove just a small amount of brass right here. This chanfer cutter will do the trick. Perfect. Retainer wire. Nice. The click nests in all the ratchet teeth now. Big improvement. This other ratchet wheel mechanism needs some help as well. Mineral spirits to remove the blackened oil and dirt. The old oil has stained the wood black. The mineral spirits seem to be pulling the black stain out of the wood. Once it's all cleaned, I'll apply a clear tongue oil. This will bring out the natural color of the wood. It'll also protect the wood from moisture swelling and help with dirt and dust as well. I've removed all the items that were fastened with screws. The items attached with nails and such, I left in place. Also, the springs that were fastened permanently were left in place. There's no need to cause damage to the wood and the items attempting to remove items not meant to be removed. Peg these holes out until the peg wood comes out clean. Cock for the verge. Strike control cam. It needs to be adjusted so there is low friction on the control lever. This click lever locks in place for each turn. Nice solid lock. Strike control arm bracket. Now to address the loose joints in the frame. This wood dowel pin is loose. It has a wood wedge installed to swell the back end here. It's quite loose. I've seen these frames split and destroyed when people attempt to take them apart to restore. I don't like the idea of putting in nails, screws, or other wood wedges to snug the frame on these. If the clock wasn't going to be put into service, it wouldn't really bother. We want a working movement here, so need to snug these joints up without defacing it. All these joints are prone to becoming loose. I'll use this vacuum pump to help deliver the glue to the inside of the wood joint. Compressed air enters here, flows through the Venturi assembly pump, and exits here. This is the exhaust tubing. This metal pipe is where the vacuum is created. A regulator to control the airflow. A vacuum pressure gauge. This one measures in inches of mercury. It measures positive as well as negative atmospheric pressure. It's measuring positive 0.5 PSI at the moment. I'll use the putty instead of hard fittings because it's faster. Shows negative 0.4 inches of mercury. I'd like to get it down to about negative 15 inches of mercury. I'll keep increasing the air pressure until it reads about negative 15 inches. That'll work. Now to build a seal around these uneven obstacles. Apply some wood glue to the back side of the joint. Hook up the vacuum hose to the top.
Nice. The vacuum pulled the adhesive through the whole joint. A nice, non-destructive way to re-glue these joints. Needs a bushing here. Reamer. Fits just fine. This is the other end. It's a little loose as well. Amazing all these brass pieces being made from cast brass. This locking jaw tool comes in handy for these odd jobs. This bushing needs to be replaced. It's a non-standard bushing in wood, so I'll need to fabricate a bushing pushing tool. This part fits into the bushing and this end into the steel punch. Always remove these by pressing them into the inside of the movement. I'll use a wooden anvil so as not to leave any dents and tool marks on the wooden plate. Original bushing. It's been hand worked on the end to make it tapered. It's also made from plate brass and bent or curled to create a round bushing. If you look closely, you can see the seam where the two ends meet each other. The new bushing is complete, ready to install. Always install them from the inside and tapered end first. Do a fit check. A little tight. Need to adjust the depth slightly deeper. Looks great now. Now the rear plate. Pressed out nicely. Runs nice and smooth. Replaced all the bushings that needed it on the time side. Now to see how the gears mesh with each other. Ready to go back together. Tension washer, strike control wheel, hour wheel, get it all oiled up. I removed the rust from the bells. Not a mere finish, but looks much better after a quick buff. Here's that spacer that's made from wood. and the nut that's hand carved from a piece of wood. I've put some weight on the time side. It's got a little recoil in it. I'll need to reduce the weight until most of the recoil is gone. Now to find a taper pin for the missing one on the front center post. This will keep the gears from moving forward too far. This hand washer that came on the movement is much too large. It's the wrong size and configuration. It needs to be a washer with a square in the center. Not quite large enough, so I'll hand trim it to fit. Fits nice. It keeps the hand fastener from loosening. 
and the taper pin locks the hand assembly to the center shaft. This count wheel triggers the chime release lever every 15 minutes. The three quarter position strikes the large bell nine times for nine o'clock and the small bell three times for three quarters past the hour. This cam wheel controls the hour strike and is advanced each hour by this steel pin. Advance to the next hour. Bell hammers in action. This is the wooden alarm cam. It's connected with a clutch slip joint directly to the hour tube. It's rotated to set the alarm. This steel control rod is the alarm hammer trigger. When it falls into the low spot of the cam, the alarm hammer is activated. Watch closely. The control rod is about to fall into the low part of the cam. The alarm lever activation wheel is rope driven. Each pin pushes the alarm camshaft wire alternately to activate the alarm hammer back and forth. I'll set it in motion so we can see the motion working. Once the alarm goes off, it's time to wind the rope drive. And in slow motion, The clock is missing the original pendulum and pendulum rod. The owner sent these three possible ones to use. I'm going to choose this one to use. Because it has these small half round recessed areas built right into the original casting. The recessed areas are for a pendulum rod to fit into like this. It just needs a tension spring for it to work with a single rod. This spring still will work once it's modified. The pendulum rod nests through here and the tension spring holds it nice and snug. The movement is missing the two side dust covers. So I'll create a full size drawing of what is needed. The wood type is unknown, possibly some old growth black forest wood. I have some salvaged old growth lumber here 
for these old projects. Lumber yards don't carry this stuff. Nice piece of quarter sawn American white oak from the late 1800s. A full scale drawing makes things go faster. hole for the door latch. Hinges will mount here. Front movement clearance cutout. Looking good so far. Just need to mount the hinges. Hinges will be shaped like an L and the door latch will go here. I'll use this thin soft wire to fasten the hinges. This thicker wire will work for the hinges themselves and door latch. Work on the hinges first. This will work great and it's the way the original was fabricated. the hinge support hole. It locks the hinge in place, keeps it from sliding laterally. Holes for the hinge strap support. Keeps the hinge from moving away from the door. This is the way the original doors were fabricated. The movement is also missing the pendulum leader. This will work great. It feeds through the verge slot and fastens to the pendulum leader hanger. Looking good. Time to put the back on.
Since the original wood has dry termite holes in it, the owner wanted the new doors to also have bug holes to match. I used a drill bit to put some blind holes in the doors. We were lucky. The original movement had the original wire mounts for the hinges and the door latch. Just needed to fabricate the doors to fit the original hardware. This door locking pin just needs one bend and it should work fine. Removable doors for easy access. Simple but effective design. The color blended in nicely. Here's the test stand I use for these. It's actually a perch rather than a shelf. Gives clearance for the pendulum, chains, and rope. The perch supports the bottom of the clock frame. It prevents the frame of the movement from sagging from the heavy weights. Get the perch level. It helps to mark the wall or if it's mounted permanently to put a fastener in the bottom. The bottom of the frame on this one is twisted from the heavy weights. A shim will fix that. Some of these don't have a pendulum leader and on those the pendulum rod attaches at the top on the pendulum leader hanger. Having a pendulum leader makes it easier and quicker to remove the pendulum rod. On the side here, there's a rope that can be pulled to activate the strike mechanism. A nice mid 1800s Black Forest wag on the wall clock reworked to working condition.